Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Natalie Richardson. I am a melanoma survivor and the managing director at Save Your Skin Foundation. I welcome you to today's webinar presentation, giving us a recap of all the news related to skin cancer from the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO, Congress that was held earlier this month. To give us this comprehensive overview, we are honored to welcome the highly esteemed Dr. Omid Hamid. I will hand the introduction to Kathy in a moment, but first a few logistics. All participants in the audience for today's webinar will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the session. If we have time, there will be a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. You will see at the right-hand side of your screen an option to type in a question under the word question. <laughs> Please feel free to ask your questions throughout the presentation, and we will do our best to answer them in the last segment. If there are any questions that do not get an immediate answer, we will contact you with a reply and any discussion you wish to have after the webinar via email. This session will be recorded and will be available for viewing in English on the Save Your Skin Foundation website and YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining us. We'll now begin. And with that, I will introduce Kathy Barnard, my friend and mentor, the founder and president of Save Your Skin Foundation. Thanks, Nat. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm thrilled today to be introducing a good friend and medical advisor to the Save Your Skin Foundation. Dr. Hamid, MD, is the Chief of Translational Research and Immuno-Oncology at the Angelus Clinic and Research Institute. He also serves as the Director of the Melanoma and Phase I programs. His areas of expertise include immunotherapy and Phase I drug development. Dr. Hamid has published extensively and has been at the forefront of the development of paradigm-shifting breakthroughs, including BRAF MEC targeted agents, CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, and PDL one therapies. His current interests include new immunotherapeutic options for patients, including bispecific antibodies, adoptive T-cell therapy, and oncological therapies with a focus on combinational approaches, resulting in potentially greater patient benefit. Through his leadership, the Angelus Clinic has fostered a program that combines expert clinical care with teaching and leading clinical research. Dr. Hamid is recognized as one of the preeminent immuno-oncologists and melanoma specialists in the world. Without further ado, my good friend, Dr. Hamid, over to you. Hey, so thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction, Kathy, you're very kind. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending the Save Your Skin Foundation, and uh, I wanted to just uh, say how wonderful our collaboration has been in being able to help patients in the United States and Canada together. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, Melanoma 2021, and then at the end we'll talk about other skin cancers and what we've, we've learned about some of the smaller population of patients that we see in the clinic. I would like to say that uh, throughout this time, the Angels Clinic is, has changed and we've become bigger and have become a uh, affiliate of the Cedar sinai Cancer uh, Center and all of Cedar sinai Cancer. Um, my uh, Twitter and my email are here for anyone who wants to reach out and discuss. I'm going to learn how to use these. These are my disclosures. Um, so where are we in 2021? is a is a good question and ASCO really stepped up this year to tell us how we're treating metastatic disease what's coming on and where we have to think to move and so let's say what we have now is five year overall survival data that's coming forth and showing that within the last 10 years we've really pushed survival uh in five year overall survival that used to be uh, very low and under the teens and a median overall survivals that were under a year that were about six to eight months have now really changed. We have multiple targeted and multiple immunotherapeutic combinations. Let me get into some of that. Well, <clears throat> the king of the hill has been either single PD-1 therapy or combination with ipilimumab, nivolumab, and Jed Wolchuk uh, showed us six and a half year outcomes in patients on these regimens. As you'll remember, these were patients that were randomized, they were untreated. Uh, and we looked at tumor expression of PD-1 and BRAF status, things that 
you hear about, but helping us to make decisions. And what we've learned now as we've gone down the road at six and a half years is that first line anti-CTLA-4 therapy with ipilimumab is no longer a standard. Either a single agent PD-1 therapy, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, other, or any backbone of therapy that has a PD-1 therapy such as a clinical trial, or as we looked forward in the combination of uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab, anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. What we found here is higher response rates, but we clearly didn't know what that meant in progression-free and overall survival. And here's what we have here. Uh, in all comers, you can see here the progression-free survival. You cannot ever look at this black line again, that single agent ipilimumab. What you have to try and do is try and tease out information between ipilimumab, nivolumab versus just nivolumab to understand where to go. Remember, this trial, although it had 900 patients, was never powered to show combination better than single agent. So what we're making here are some uh, educated evaluations. Even when we go and look at subsets of these patients, we cannot say this is absolute because the statistics are not set up that way, but we can find some things. And as we move out here and looking at overall survival here at six years, we're finding 50% of people alive at six years. So you're understanding now that our survival curves that used to be at 50% of people have passed at somewhere between six to eight months, this is 2011, now in 2021 is all the way out to six years. So what do I say? I say to patients that come, that the average person with metastatic or unresectable melanoma has six years of runway. And what we've done in the last six years has been exponentially better than what we had in the last 60 years. So there's a lot to be a positive about. Now, if you're looking to try and find a way of subgroups that look like they're really doing better with combination, look no further than the evaluation of the BRAF mutant patients. Now, remember this is uh, prospective data, but the numbers are small. Uh, but as you can see here, the BRAF mutant patients, as far as overall survival, starting with ipinevo are doing better. So that's indication of where to go with those patients. Uh, but the BRAF wild type, very similar. So here where you feel more confident in taking patients into clinical trials with PD-1, other combinations, et cetera, and more on that later. What we also found out is if you look here at overall survival by best overall response at 12 months, these patients that have complete response on every arm are doing better on the NEVO and the NEVO IPI arm, they have the best survivals. And what that's indicating to me is the idea that we need to push harder and get these patients who are on the bottom here with stable disease. You can see here at five years, the overall survival is almost double if you get a complete response. And so we're gonna push our patients and find regimens that take those patients from partial responses to complete responses. Well, we've also heard about, what about the toxicity of these regimens? Well, Bristol has looked and looked at combination, but flipping the doses, giving the full dose nivolumab throughout and bringing the ipilimumab dose downwards. So this was Checkmate 511 that was presented here, some updated data. Now remember that this was just done as a trial to look at toxicities. It wasn't done as a trial to statistically show their equivalence. And so what we're taking here is the data and trying to find some more out about it. What we found is that the significant toxicities were much less, 34% versus 48%. So this may be a regimen for someone where you wanna avoid higher risk toxicities but you still want to give them combination because that's where you want to go and you want to give a, a big oomph at the first dose. Well, what would you think about that, showing that responses are similar in response rates? And 
looking at progression-free and overall survivals that are similar. The thing I would say here is that we don't know enough about the BRAF mutant patients. We don't know enough about the mucosal melanoma patients that don't respond as well to single agent NEVO. The brain METS patients, so are those patients with a PDL1 under 1%, those where we think if the NEVO should really be a rapidly progressive disease. So for me, this is data that shows if I have a patient, I'm concerned about some toxicities, I can do the flip dose. Um, so moving on, the questions that come, yes, less toxicity. Uh, can we give them more NEVO? Yes, but we don't really understand the subset analysis. Uh, so, but what we're understanding is for some patients who you want to avoid this severe toxicities, this may be a regimen. So, what else? Well, the hottest news came from Relativity 47. We'd known that there are other checkpoints, but up till now, as we had combined them with PD-1, we had come up with no single trial that showed overall survival benefit. And as we're moving on, we had looked at uh, IDO inhibitors, we had looked at oncolytics with TVEC and multiple uh, uh, injectables with PD-1. This trial has shown initial benefit in progression-free survival. LAG-3 is another checkpoint co-expressed uh, co on tumor, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and they've been shown to be synergistic in the lab. We felt that they worked. There was data that came from Paulo Asierto that showed that once you progressed on a PD-1, if you gave a LAG-3 plus a PD-1, about 11% of patients could respond again. So this looked at a combination of <clears throat> Uh, LAG3 and PD-1 versus PD-1 alone. Interesting here is this was one-to-one, -one, and this is now a fixed dose combination. So these two drugs come in one bag, they're given once every four weeks, and once we find out more about it, they can constitute a new standard. What we found, what we showed, is that the progression-free survival, the time that you stay on study, is longer with the combination. And it is very significant. At any time, when you look at the hazard ratio, you have about a 25% better chance of staying on therapy. What we don't know is whether this translates into long-term survival benefit, whether response rates are better. And we'll look forward to updated data. For now, this is looking like a good standard to think about moving forward. Interestingly, even those patients who expressed little amounts of LAG3 on their cells, on their tumor cells, guess what? They still benefited. And this is contra to what we had seen in the patients that were immunotherapy pretreated. So looking at moving this to for, uh, earlier and earlier in therapy. I presented some data looking at a similar type of combination, but drugs made by another company. What's interesting here is look at the response rates. 66% in patients who were untreated and PD-1 naive, showing that we may be able to get a combination that not only is beneficial, but may be able to be utilized for a long, of a greater group of people. What we're waiting for here is to understand which subgroups benefit and what overall survival is. But I'm sure we'll see more trials available for patients with this combination. Also, what we've seen here is significant toxicity rates that are low. So those grade three toxicities, grade three to five, that were 30% or 50% with ifinevo are about 19% with the combination, and they're more manageable side effects, so more to come. But what we've also seen is still with these combination response rates in PD-1 treated patients, about 13%, 12.5 with relatlimab and nivolumab, 
and 13% in this combination I presented at ASCO. What's coming down the pike? Also drugs that target VEGF. These are vascular endothelial growth factor. That's a big name you don't need to remember, but this is like pruning the vessels that feed the tumors. And we've known from the days of Steve Hody putting uh, Avastin, which is another VEGF agent, along with anti-CTLA-4 therapy, that this may be viable. And again, LEAP4 looked at a drug called levatinib and gave it to patients. You can see BRAF, heavily pretreated patients, even those with CTLA-4 and PD-1, and we're seeing response rates of 20%. And so more drugs that are viable that look at other mechanisms in metastatic melanoma. What's next? This combination is being looked at first line and a trial has accrued looking at just Keytruda or Keytruda and this uh, lymvatinib drug. What's interesting to know is this combination is already approved for another solid tumor, endometrial carcinoma. So it does work in other cancers and we're looking forward to understanding where it works in melanoma. So there is life beyond just single agent anti-PD-1 therapy. We've known combining uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 after a single agent PD-1 has response rates of possibly 30%. High dose IL-2 has response rates. And what else is there? Well, adoptive T-cell therapy, which is a therapy where you take a patient's tumor, surgically take it out, and then work to uh, take out those infiltrating T cells and reinfuse them to the patient was presented again at ASCO. Um, this is uh, 66 patients. <clears throat> they had all failed PD-1 therapy and about 70% had failed CTLA-4 therapy. This is how it works. Patient signs up, a surgeon such as Dr. Ferries at my site does a surgical resection, sterilely takes the tumor out of the body. And then that tumor from anywhere in the body is shipped centrally to Iovans and they clean out the T cells, they grow up the T cells to billions of cells, put them in a bag, freeze them and send it back to you. So now in the past, Patients would have had to go to specialty centers where they had a lab specifically to do this. Now this is done centrally. While awaiting these T cells to come, patient is hospitalized, gets a chemotherapeutic regimen to clear the marrow of non-helpful T cells. They get Lifelusa, which is this adopted T cell product, and about up to six doses of IL-2. Interesting here, IL-2 is not meant to be dosed until you get sick from it. It's just meant as an adjunct to uh, agitate the T cells, and then the patients are discharged once their counts recover. What we've seen here is a response rate of 60, um, 66 patients, a response rate of 36%. So this is in patients who have failed checkpoint inhibitor, either CTLA-4 or PD-1. The um, Average patient that responded is still responding six months later. So huge duration of responses, uh, about 60% of patients having responses greater than 12 months, and about 80% of patients having a reduction in tumor burden. And this is a wonderful response in patients who had no other options. Again, this is at the FDA for uh, uh, approval. What we found, and this is a lot of evaluation, but I'm gonna spend a short amount of time, that we found about 80% of the responders had never even responded to PD-1 therapy. And even though you responded, the patients that had less PD-1 therapy before coming in had longer durations of benefit. So there's a lot to clear up here, uh, but this is at FDA going forward. Multiple clinical trials are coming, and even a trial looking at it in patients who have not had PD-1. So combination with PD-1 in melanoma, in treatment naive patients, all seven patients, so this is only seven patients, but all seven patients had a response. And what we're looking forward here is 
to see what long-term works out. Now, you can spend a lot of time talking about immunotherapy. I want to make sure that I don't gloss over the fact that five-year data in BRAF mutant uh, patients is out there. And what we've seen in the combination of encorafenib and venimetinib, which is uh, median survivals that are long, overall survival rates about 33 to 35% at five years. And a long tail of the curve here. So whatever BRAF inhibitor you're using, combination has shown long-term overall survival benefit and manageable toxicities. Now, we promised once we had better uh, metastatic therapy, we'd bring it to the adjuvant setting, and we have. We have now drugs, uh, ipilimumab, dubrafenib, trametinib for BRAF mutant, single agent PD-1, that is showing immunotherapy and targeted therapy benefit and decreased rates of relapse. We're looking at overall survival data to come in, but improved progression free, uh, relapse free survival doing well. We updated the Keynote 54, this is the Keytruda adjuvant data, and showed that uh, at any given time, uh, being alive and recurrence free or alive and metastasis free is better when you get adjuvant therapy. Why is what is why is that important? Well, recurrence and metastasis comes from with significant morbidity, and uh, it's important to try and avoid that. Lex Egermont presented data on those patients who were on the randomized trial and on those patients who crossed over from placebo, what we saw is about half of the patients recurred before a year. Uh, we, what we found is about uh, 47 patients recurred after being treated at a year. So we're now finding that we, those patients are recurring and we're treating them, we're understanding more what to do on recurrence for those patients. And just going back to the uh, LAG3 data, this, this may be an indication on those patients who would need combination therapy when they recur after seeing PD-1 in the adjuvant. <clears throat> we're now looking forward to utilizing these even before uh, surgery, and we're looking at combination ipilimumab, nivolumab, uh, and what it gives us in a neoadjuvant uh, fashion before doing the surgery, giving it to patients with melanoma and going forward. We presented combinations with LAG3. So these are patients who are resectable. They initially get combination or any immunotherapy, and then they get a scan, get a surgical resection, and we evaluate how they do. And this can help us to understand what therapies work and make decisions. Uh, if you're not responding to the therapy, maybe go to another therapy in your adjuvant setting. Uh, but more than that, understanding which markers in tumors indicate which patients are to respond. We call those predictive and prognostic markers. And we can take that information and biopsy patients with metastatic disease and utilize that information to choose the first line regimen. Is it ipinevo? Is it uh, PD-1 plus uh, adoptive T cell therapy? Is it PD-1 plus lag? Is it none of the above going to clinical trials? Should they go on a triplet therapy trial? And so this comes from uh, evaluating and interrogating earlier and earlier disease. What was so interesting here with these combinations again with LAG3, look at that 66% major response um, of near complete response before surgery. We've seen that they may indicate a population of patients that would do better, that you may change their outcome. And so we're going forward and looking at combinations with PD-1 and LAG-3, as you can see here, combinations with PD-1, CTLA-4, with high complete responses. And 
high uh, ability to get these patients with early benefit before surgery. Now, why do we like that? Because in other tumors like breast cancer, we know that if you can get this type of major response, you're affecting outcome for patients. And what we're trying to do is find baseline markers to use as a surrogate for response. And this is data that was presented at ASCO last year, where if you look at baseline markers, looking at the interferon gamma signature in the tumor, the tumor mutational burden, you can find people who would benefit early and do well uh, without recurrence, 100% without recurrence. So we're taking this earlier and earlier, and then we're taking this com these combinations later and later. And as you have seen, the holy grail of helping patients with brain metastases, we've come from trying anti-CTLA-4 therapy and showing response rates of 16%, looking at anti-PD-1 therapy and showing response rates of 22% to going further and looking at combinations that are giving us response rates that are 57% uh, or more, uh, or 46% here. And this is data that's been updated in multiple patients. As you can see on the top left, this is a nivolumab, ipilimumab from the ABC trial, where you're looking at three-year uh, progression-free survivals in the brain are around 50%. You can see here a plateau and a tail of the curve. Here is Checkmate 204, which was ipilimumab, nivolumab, and progression-free survival here, uh, 72%, and, and really 60% going out to three years. And if you don't progress in the brain, these are patients who are doing well and uh, having long-term survival benefit. And also with uh, targeted agents. Here's overall survival data. When you talk about patients who had brain mets and way back when in the dark ages, we were talking about median survival, the time that half of the patients had succumbed to their disease being somewhere around four months, we're now looking at patients with major disease in their brain having median survivals out at five years of 50% with anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1 combinations. Now, clinical trials now are looking at adding things to this. Uh, key maker that's from Merck is looking to add lymvatinib, which was the VEGF drug, or an anti-TIGIT antibody, and other combinations going forward. So if you aren't someone who benefits from this, there are clinical trials out there for you. We've also done better in moving these stuff forward into patients with leptomeningeal disease. And you'll remember that those are patients that the disease is not just in the brain, but in the covering of the brain. And this is exquisite data that comes from uh, Isabella Glitza, who's at MD Anderson and her group. And MD Anderson has been known for tackling the hardest questions. What happens when it moves outside of the organ, the brain, and goes into the coverings? Now, these are poor prognostic uh, patients, and these are patients who have usually by the time they see us, they've seen everything. And this was a trial that was represented and updated, giving intrathecal nivolumab, not just giving it systemically, but using a needle and injecting it into that area between the brain and the covering of the brain where the fluid that bathes the brain is. And what they have seen is, well, there's a lot of data here, but what they have seen is the ability to affect long-term benefit for patients. Um, they have patients who have lived past 12 months, 35% of the patients. And you can look down here and see someone here who's at 100 weeks out. And these are usually patients who have exhausted everything, targeted therapies, anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, and there are no clinical trials available for them. And what Dr. Glitz and her team are showing is the ability to move forward with these patients. Now, um, this is uh, the point where I flip to uh, other therapies and I leave my talk. Well, 
and move on to uh, metastatic uveal melanoma. So there's stuff for everybody. Ocular melanoma now has a drug called Tabentafus, and this is a drug that targets the receptor on the T cell and the melanoma cell, ocular melanoma cell. And in multiple trials, taking uh, ocular melanoma patients with metastatic disease, Tabentafus has shown not only benefits in progression-free survival when it's compared to investigators' choice of PD-1 versus, uh, I, I believe, uh, chemo, uh, but it's also shown overall survival benefit. And it's looked at patients at a, who are on therapy at 100 days, and those patients even doing better. Uh, so this is now at the FDA for approval. Uh, and, and moving forward, possibly even into the adjuvant setting. Now, what else do we have? We're now looking at trials with triplet combinations for patients, trials in patients who have failed these drugs and now need other drugs. So here at the Angeles Clinic, uh, we will be opening another adoptive T-cell trial. We'll be opening trials that not only take anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, but add a third thing to it, like a vascular drug or another checkpoint inhibitor. For example, trials that now add not only LAG3, but TIM3 to PD-1 therapy. We're looking to tackle other rarer types of melanoma, like mucosal melanoma that's associated with lower response rates, uh, newer targets for ocular melanoma, whether it be utilizing um, <clears throat> whether it be utilizing a backbone of anti-CTLA4, anti-PD1 plus a third drug, or moving those combinations into the adjuvant setting. So we're clearly making inroads into all types of melanoma. Uh, let's now talk about what this means for other solid tumors. You know, five years ago, you would say it meant nothing. But now we know that due to the fact that basal cell carcinomas and cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas harbor a high tumor mutational burden, there are lots of changes in their DNA, that these are very immunogenic tumors. And starting from there, the idea that these tumors would respond to immunotherapy led to them being utilized as patients on clinical trials with checkpoint inhibitors, including PD-1. And now you can see where I'm going here. Just as five years ago or six years ago, we were just introducing single agent PD-1 drugs into melanoma, we are now moving from single agent drugs to combinatorials, even in patients with basal cell carcinoma and patients with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Interestingly, single agent PD-1 therapies have had high response rates, 40 to 50% in those subset of patients. That's what we also know about Merkel cell cancers. So we are continually using the data from melanoma, metastatic melanoma and their clinical trials and moving it to the other non-melanoma, just skin cancers. Now, what else have we left off? Well, interesting uh, findings at ASCO 2021 also showed that we can utilize immune therapy for patients who are immune suppressed. And what does that mean? Well, those are the subset of patients who either have a low-grade lymphoma or a low-grade leukemia whose immune systems are not as um, active as others, or they need immune suppression in the form of steroids because of uh, connective tissue disease or autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Crohn's disease, or patients who are status post-transplant. And the group at uh, Mass General presented their data of a handful of patients like that and showed that in those patients, those handful of patients all had cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. 
showed that you get equivalent response rates and manageable toxicities. So we're clearly now looking at a broader group of patients that we can treat. So where are we going? Well, we're going into a time where one can see that within the next year or so, three paradigm shifting therapies may be approved for melanoma, whether it is the Tabentafus bispecific drug for ocular melanoma in patients with metastatic disease, or the combination of uh, anti-PD-1 and anti-LAG retherapy as we showed in Relativity 47 for patients with metastatic or unresectable melanoma, or the data that we presented with adoptive T-cell therapy through uh, IOVANCE's lithocell therapy. And that's amazing that at one year, we're looking at the possible approval of three drugs. We went decades with, without any approvals. And over the course of the last decade, we have made major inroads into helping a greater population of our patients. What's next? Well, here at the Angeles Clinic and throughout, there are clinical trials looking at rare mutations found in melanoma. We know that uh, certain drugs work to target mutations in other tumors. And we are now being able to utilize the understanding that some of those mutations exist in um, melanoma and we can use the drugs that are approved for other tumors. Let me give you an example. Like a ROS1 mutation, you don't need to know that, but in lung cancer, it exists and there are drugs that target it. It very rarely exists in melanoma, but there are now basket studies are looking at how that works. CDK mutations exist in breast cancer and there are drugs that are FDA approved. There are now clinical trials looking at single agent or combinations of those agents. Uh, there are more, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. I think that as I come to a close in the talk and we come to the point of questions, I would say that every year that we've come back together and had these discussions, we've made major inroads into controlling melanoma, preventing recurrence, improving survival and outcome with metastatic disease, working towards cure, and dealing with the issues that we would never deal with, which are patients with metastatic disease to the brain and to the covering of it. And we can all hold our heads up high knowing that all of the benefits that we have shown here, all of the inroads are being taken and utilized as therapies for other solid tumors. So the progress made in cutaneous tumors, including melanoma, has translated into trials and benefits for patients with other solid tumors. So with that, I'd like to thank you again for uh, spending time with me listening and the opportunity for me to talk about the work that we're doing as a community. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. If anybody would like to put them into the question bar on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, Dr. Hamid, you talked you talk briefly about triplets. Um, can you give us your perspective on you know, how those are going and what we can expect? Well, I think it's very early, but those are going well. We're accruing to uh, multiple clinical trials that are on, um, that have many arms that are, I would say, dynamic. As soon as another drug is available, it's added on to a backbone of therapy, whether it's just PD-1 or PD-1 plus CTLA-4 or other. And I think it's very, very early to say how things are going. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple. Um, uh, Dr. Weber at uh, NYU. Uh, Dr. Hody at uh, Dana-Farber, Ryan Sullivan at Mass General, and ourselves here at the Angels Clinic and Research Institute are uh, accruing to a trial that has epilimumab, nivolumab, and tocilizumab. 
Tocilizumab is an IL-6 inhibitor. It is uh, what you use if you have uncontrolled immune toxicity. We've also understood that IL-6 is a negative regulator of the immune system. So we're accruing to a trial looking at that triplet with two aims, decreasing the toxicities that we see with this combination and increasing efficacy. That's one trial. Uh, we're accruing to a trial of multiple sites that looks at patients who have progressed on a PD-1 inhibitor, but adds not just PD-1, not just LAG-3, but LAG-3 and TIM-3, looking at attacking it in multiple ways. Uh, so I would say that we look forward to the next round of presentations where some of the early data will be presented. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Hamid, for, uh, for this very excellent presentation. It is a hopeful and positive time for, for melanoma and skin cancer patients, for sure. Um, we do have a few more questions. Lots of thank yous are rolling in. <laughs> so um, thank you to everyone who is saying thank you and thank you for doing this. Um, one question that uh, we will have time for, I think, is uh, we're seeing more funding research on acral melanoma. Are there any therapies currently available or that you're seeing uh, showing promise for stage four acral melanoma patients besides the known mevo ipi combo? Right, so I would say for, for our acrals and our mucosals, uh, what we're looking at is some of, so I'd say for like, for example, this idea about the VEGF targeted agents plus a PD-1 has looked very promising. And so those are the trials that are the, the levatinib and the others. Unfortunately, acrals make such a small subset of everything that uh, you have to look and see where are we seeing major advances and go for that. Uh, if I had if I had a patient with an acral melanoma that had progressed, I would look for adoptive T cell therapies. I'd look for other combinatorials. I totally skipped over discussing intratumoral therapy because I, it, we're really at a point where that's, those are all clinical trials, but if you have injectable nodes and if you have injectable uh, skin lesions, that's a no-brainer. But we're now understanding that the patients who have liver metastases, pound for pound, stage for stage, do worse. And we are now accruing to trials that look at injecting those oncolytics or those injectable therapies through CT directly into the liver with the hopes of getting improved systemic response. Wow, fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from uh, a stage 3C melanoma patient um, who has completed surgery and uh, um, Pardon me, just another question coming in. Uh, stage 3C had surgery and, um, and has uh, had treatment. Um, just want to double, double check here. Yep, it'd be, no, Nevo. Um, so far, blood work is normal, side effects are minimal. Question for all adjuvant patients. Uh, now that prescribed treatments are finishing, should, should they be asking about any additional treatments or trials? I know our access is a bit different in Canada from the States, but is there something that adjuvant patients should be watching for? No, I would say it's not something to be watching for, but I think a up and coming idea and something that we uh, haven't talked about, uh, but it's usually in my talks, is this idea now of understanding the role of circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and that's a blood test, and it looks for uh, looking at mutations through picking them up in the blood. Easiest way to say it. Mm -hmm. And usually we do it before the surgery, but you can do it right after. Uh, if you pick up something, but, but classically, you do it before the surgery. You see if there's anything there. Uh, you look at it right after the surgery. You see if it still exists or it's gone to zero. And you do it during your therapy. See if it goes lower or it stays stable or it's increasing. And hopefully that'll give us an idea about the patient's who are at increased risk of recurrence, and we can surveil them better. Um, right now, the standard is one year of therapy. I have not seen anything that adds more to that, nor 
uh, nor are we at the place to do that. Now, uh, I would say what some of the data is indicating to us is if you have a have been treated in the adjuvant with PD-1 and you recur, your next therapy should be a combination either off trial or on trial. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, I will, um, with respect to your time, because I know that you are uh, in high demand and have to run off directly after this, uh, we have a couple more questions, but I think that um, Kathy and I can handle them. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll reach out if something, if somebody does come up with something afterwards, but uh, I will take this time to say thank you very much on behalf of Kathy and the Save Your Skin team and all of our community of, uh, of patients and caregivers that rely on you and can't thank you enough for your, your work and uh, that of your colleagues. Um, well, I I would say to you guys that um, I've had the best time with my colleagues in, in Canada. And I'm not going to name all of them, but I would say, you know, working with Marcus Butler, David Hogg, Teresa Petrella, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, has been great. You have phenomenal <laughs> Corey Metcalf uh, and others. I'm sorry, uh, Wilson, if I missed you, uh, but there are so many others there. Um, you have a great community there. I, I would say that the future is only bright. We have new standards. Uh, we have stuff for everybody. And clinical trials, clinical trials, clinical trials. Is couldn't agree more. Yeah, couldn't I, agree more. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your time today and in preparation for this session. Uh, I'll send you the recording, Dr. Hamid, but also uh, everyone in the audience. Thank you for attending. Uh, I'll mention that this session is recorded and we will be making it available tomorrow morning on the YouTube channel. If you have any additional questions you think of after, send them over to me, Natalie at SaveYourSkin.ca or to Kathy, Kathy at SaveYourSkin.ca, and uh, we will do our best to get back to you. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Hamid and Kathy. Thanks, Dr. Thank Hamid. With that, we'll end. Thanks.